You're watching Stat News Global. I'm Amitabh Bravi, and it's a pleasure to be joined from New York City by Dr. Rajan Menon. Uh, Professor Menon, thank you so much for your time, sir. Thank you for the invitation, Amitabh. Professor, I just uh, wanted to get into the latest that's happening with Alexei Navalny. Now, uh, Dmitry Peskov, the Kremlin spokesperson, has uh, discounted all the claims of poisoning, saying the German doctors have been too hasty, there's no need for an investigation. Uh, what's your reading of what's happening there? Well, obviously, you know, I'm not a medical specialist, but the Russian, no. <laughs> the Russian explanation by the, the uh, doctors who were overseeing his care was that he had uh, a low blood sugar episode yeah. and went into this uh, coma. Most people find that very hard to believe. There's a video of him writhing in pain in the, in the aircraft. Okay. Now, the Germans have said he was possibly poisoned. I will note that I don't know whether he was, but he's certainly not the first opponent of Mr. Putin to have been poisoned. When you're talking about that, that, that last point of yours, uh, not the first one, uh, you go back to the, the most famous, the, the Skripals, of course, Sergei and Yulia. Uh, you had uh, Alexander Litvinenko as well. You had Pyotr Verzilov. Uh, what, 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 how do you... Uh, Litvinenko, who absolutely. survived the poisoning. So uh, how do you uh, actually look at it in terms of the Russian denial, yet the other narrative which says this is the way that, they, that uh, Putin deals with his opponents? You know, if you look at the list, Vladimir Karamurza, in no, no particular mm -hmm. chronological order, Politkovskaya, sure. Skripal, Litvinenko, and now possibly Navalny, you have to say it's a remarkable coincidence that the opponents of President Putin end up being poisoned. Now, whether it's him or people acting on his behalf as rogue elements is beside the point. But what links all of these individuals is that they're well-known opponents of the state. Professor Menon, what's the purpose, if it is state-sponsored in any manner, say the Navalny incident, now what exactly are they hoping to achieve? It's just scaring off other opponents? Or? I think the Russian state has absolutely no concern about external security, but I think they have a well-honed fear, going back at least to the 2010-11 uh, protests in Moscow, which took Putin by surprise, of internal upheaval led by an opposition. Now, the Russian opposition is weak and fragmented, but social media has changed everything. So I think that that is the main goal here. And we also see, Professor Menon, uh, well, it's been over a month now, protests in Khabarovsk. Uh, th that's been one anti-Kremlin, so as to speak, even though it was the communists there, which surprisingly who were leading that. Uh, how do you see the internal opposition within, you said fragmented, within Russia itself? How do you read that whole political situation? Um, it's regionally fragmented and fragmented by issues, but if you had to pick one person who embodies the opposition nationwide, it would have to be Alexander Navalny, who's been a thorn in the Kremlin side for a long time, primarily using the issue of corruption to discredit the leadership. But uh, do you see them as a viable, especially in light of uh, what's happened in the uh, constitutional amendments with uh, President Putin uh, literally being able to uh, stay on till what, 2036? I would say that viable may be too strong a word. I would say they're persistent. They operate under extraordinary restrictions, police presence against demonstrations, denial of access to official media or media friendly to the state. And it is also uh, a fact that President Putin is not without domestic support. It's very important to, to understand this. There, there, there are reservoirs of support for him. So um, it is not that the, the Putin government is any, in any sense in imminent peril. But if they have to worry about one thing, it is what the demonstration effect of the protests in Belarus might have on Russia. It's very interesting that the poisoning of Navalny happened right after the Belarus protest. Now, I don't know whether they're connected, but surely it's a coincidence. About Belarus itself, Professor, what are your thoughts? Now, Putin himself may not be in peril, but uh, Lukashenko and what's happening, Svetlana Tikhanaska speaking to the EU today, saying that, you know, it's not an anti-Russia, it's not an anti-Europe or a pro-Europe protest, it's, a anti -de uh, it's a pro democracy protest. How do you see the situation evolving in Belarus? 
I think the Belarus opposition has tried to make it very clear to the Kremlin to forestall an intervention that this is not Ukraine 2014. Yeah. It's not about joining the EU. It's not about hopes about joining NATO. This is not a division between Ukrainian nationalists, um, I'm sorry, Belarusian nationalists and uh, and uh, the Russian government. It's purely about an election that the opposition views as fraudulent. Now, having said that, the Russians, I think, are in no hurry to intervene. But what happens if Lukashenko looks like he's going to fall? And he will fall only if there is a split within the security service. What the Russians will do then is hard to say. For them, it's a very major issue to intervene. First, can you put down the uprisings? Second, do you want to burn your bridges with Europe at a time when you're hoping to peel Europe away so that you can get at least the Europeans perhaps to lift sanctions? So I don't think they're eager to intervene. They're waiting and watching. But some of the comments uh, recently from the Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov, as well as Lavrov, the foreign minister, toward the opposition have been not very positive. When you look at uh, the whole situation vis-a-vis -vis the West, vis-a-vis -vis Europe, now Belarus was a buffer kind of between Russia and uh, Western Europe. But then there's also the Baltic republics who have completely... Uh, you know, supported uh, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. NATO, uh, President Trump uh, announcing that, you know, troops will move from, say, Germany to Poland. How do you see the larger game plan between NATO and Russia? Right. So President Trump being preoccupied with the election and having no strategic vision whatsoever hasn't said very much about Belarus. And it's not clear to me that he could spot Belarus on a map. <laughs> but the Europeans, on the other hand, have been watching very carefully and have limited themselves to calling for free and fair elections. They've made that the issue, and they've been in close consultations with the Russians. And I would say the Russian-EU dialogue at this particular moment is very important to forestall a crisis. We don't know yet whether Lukashenko will ride out this crisis or not. He has formidable repressive tools at his disposal, and the the opposition has to sustain this protest over a long period of time. And the question is whether it peters out or not. President Trump uh, is a different ballgame altogether, but uh, the Deputy Secretary of State, uh, Stephen Begun, is traveling to Lithuania and then to Belarus. Uh, I beg your pardon, not to Belarus, but to Russia itself. And then Ukraine, I think. Uh, how, well, how do you see the U.S. in all of this, uh, even though it's just, what, uh, a month and a half to go for the elections? Yeah, oddly enough, you know, the one thing that the, the Russians, the United States and Europe have in common is to forestall an intervention. So I think it's completely wrong to see President Putin as champing at the bit to intervene in Belarus. It would be a very difficult thing for them. All of this depends on how events in Belarus turn out, out. whether it looks like there's a regime change against uh Belarus, very quickly the, uh, the Kremlin could then say that this is a foreign plot, that a neighboring country with which they have a security treaty is imperiled and so on. Whether that leads to intervention or other means of throwing him up, I don't know. I should also add, Amitabh, that there's no love lost between Mr. Lukashenko and Mr. Putin, by the way. Oh, yes. What, he left uh, sacks of potatoes, I think, on one of his visits to uh, President Putin. But yes, that, well, that's true. Yeah, go ahead. Well, most recently, you know, they cut off subsidized oil supplies from Russia to Belarus that were very, very important to Belarus. And this February, none other than Mike Pompeo, our Secretary of State, visited uh, Lukashenko and they signed a first initial oil deal. So he, Lukashenko has been fairly adept at playing off the West and Russia. But at the moment, he's now telling Russia this is an external threat that the Russians have to do something. So he's thrown in his lot completely with Russia. When you talk about uh, the larger geopolitical situation, again, vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, and there's been a lot of blowback, pushback, you know, whatever the words you want to call, uh, I mean, describe it by. How do you see the Russia-China relationship? Because President Putin has called it, you know, something that's uh, never been unprecedented. How do you see that developing? Well, it's important to realize that this relationship has been in the making, at least since 1992, under Boris Yeltsin. Yeah. The two sides began to talk about a strategic partnership. 
It was undergirded by increasing trade from a very low base, but mainly Russian weapons transfers. Under Putin, it's diversified much more. Mm. Trade is up substantially. There's a new pipeline, relatively new, that connects China with Russia. There's significant arms sales going on, even though China's ability to make modern weaponry has increased. So this is a relationship that has its own dynamic. I think it's wrong to say this is only driven by the so-called second cold war between the West and Russia. It has a solid dynamic of its own. And the two sides, Beijing and Moscow, agree on a broad number of issues in international politics. So I think it's a relationship with a fairly sound foundation, although in the past, as you know, the relationship has had its ups and downs. But uh, sound foundation, but how do you see, uh, say, Russia and China in, in their policies when they differ? Now, when it comes to India, how, how does that uh, sit? Well, India is a very interesting case because, as you well know, India has had a very strong relationship with the Soviet Union and then yeah. Russia. Arguably, I think, uh, in the Indian foreign policy, elite, Russia is the most reliable power. So if another confrontation between China and India were to take place, I think the Russians would try very hard not to openly take sides. I think they will stay in the background and say, these are two friendly countries. We're ready to help in whatever way we can. They're not going to jump into the China column and alienate India. They have nothing to gain by doing that. What about uh, the other way around? I mean, we saw soon after Galwan defense, Mr. Rajnath Singh traveling to Moscow. That was, of course, the postponed Victory Day celebrations. But there was talk about uh, speeding up, say, uh, military supplies of aircraft, even the S-400s. Uh, not jumping into China's column, but uh, how does Russia deal with India in a situation like that? So a large percentage still of the Indian force structures of yeah. Soviet or Russian Vintage, And so there is a kind of inbuilt tendency to rely on the Russians. The Russians allow license production that many Western countries don't allow. That said, there is a very strong interest on the part of the United States, Israel, some other countries, of opening up the Indian arms market. The Russians are very determined to keep their position. And I think that in, from India's perspective, Russia has been a very reliable arms supplier. So that connection, I think New Delhi will... will try very hard to maintain. And there's no threat to the India-Russia relations from China, I should add. Uh, so it, Russia would not have to choose between India and China because the S-400 are being supplied already, one, I think, squadron to China already. They won't choose. The Chinese have not said to the Russians, the condition of our relationship is that you stop arms transfers to the Indians. I think that would be too big of an ask, as you will. And so if there was a confrontation, as there was recently, the Russians will stay in the background and act, try to act as a mediator. They have no interest whatsoever in sacrificing the relationship with India to appease the Chinese. Professor Rajan Menon, an absolute pleasure. Ochin Priyatnabil Swami Strecheti, even if it was online, thank you so Spasiwa. much again for your time. Svadobro. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> And just a reminder to our viewers, you can log on to our website, Strat News Global, to get all the latest news and analysis from an uh, Indian perspective and to support our kind of journalism on our website. You're watching Strat News Global. I'm Amitabh Brady.